2019 in Maputo that he has agreed to offer opening remarks for this session. Mr. President, we are honored to have you with us today. I would also like to acknowledge and thank Bill Colleen, CEO of AcroBridge, who will moderate a fireside chat with the president. So Bill, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Flori. I really appreciate the introduction and all the good words that you provided. Uh, good morning to everyone. This is uh, quite an exciting and remarkable day. We're all connecting digitally through uh, this uh, means of the internet. It is with a, a, an absolute great honor that I get to introduce to everyone today His Excellency Felipe Nyusi, uh, the President of the Republic of Mozambique. Uh, welcome, Mr. President. Muito obrigado, Senhora Florzil Lizer, Presidente PC do Corporate Council on Africa, CCA, e, e nossa cara amiga, ilustres participantes. Recebam todos calorosas saudações de Moçambique e felicitações a si, Lizer, e a sua equipa por nos reunirem numa altura em que as condições não permitem encontros presenciais devido à pandemia da Covid-19. Aceitamos o convite porque acreditamos que, se juntarmos esforços, iremos responder com mais eficiência ou resiliente à pandemia da Covid-19. Esta pandemia ensinou-nos a saber o quão dependemos uns dos outros para estarmos seguros e juntos procuramos uma cura através de investigação, teste e validação do tratamento. Ao testemunharmos a pandemia a desonerar-se noutras partes do mundo, nós em África, tivemos uma janela de oportunidade para agir rapidamente para prevenir a sua propagação. Em conformidade com os conselhos da Organização Mundial de Saúde, a União Africana e o Centro de Controlo e Prevenção de Doenças e outros parceiros de cooperação iniciamos prontamente campanhas de educação e sensibilização política para a pública. Em Moçambique, logo que os primeiros casos ocorreram, decidimos criar uma comissão ministerial especial e um comitê técnico-científico para aconselhar o governo e assumir a liderança nos nossos esforços de resposta. À medida que os casos aumentavam, declaramos o estado de emergência e instituímos o distanciamento social. Tornamos obrigatório o uso de máscaras e as medidas de higiene em muitos casos. Os números atuais de casos, apesar de estarem a aumentar, ainda são relativamente baixos. Moçambique registrou até o momento 757 casos positivos para a Covid-19, cinco óbitos, todos com outras causas pré-existentes e 206 casos completamente recuperados. O impacto socioeconômico é negativo na Covid, como era de esperar, e as medidas preventivas tomadas constituem uma preocupação para todos nós. As empresas não estão a funcionar em pleno e algumas encerraram. Os setores de turismo e de transporte são os mais afetados. O desemprego aumentou, afetando principalmente os grupos mais vulneráveis da nossa sociedade. Os motivos desta situação incluem o encerramento de fronteiras e o declínio de comércio internacional. Para mitigar a situação, o governo tomou medidas fiscais e monetárias para apoiar as empresas, incluindo os bancos. Fizemos dotações de recursos adicionais aos setores de saúde e proteção social. As empresas locais e inter internacionais, incluindo as americanas, responderam bem, adaptando as suas condições de trabalho e doando equipamento de proteção individual aos trabalhadores de saúde. O FMI, o Banco Mundial e o Banco Africano de Desenvolvimento têm todos respondido aos nossos apelos à assistência continuam a ser parceiros fundamentais do nosso esforço de desenvolvimento. 
Agradecemos ao governo dos Estados Unidos por apoiar a resposta destas instituições financeiras multilaterais. Estimamos que precisamos de cerca de 700 milhões de dólares americanos para mitigar o impacto da Covid-19. Estamos gratos que grande parte desse valor esteja comprometido. A nossa estratégia de desenvolvimento prioriza a agricultura e o agroprocessamento, bem como o desenvolvimento de infraestruturas, estando as empresas dos Estados Unidos bem posicionadas para investir. O setor de energia ganhou um novo impacto, não só no setor tradicional, hidroelétrico, mas também na indústria de gás natural, e estamos desejosos em aumentar as parcerias entre as empresas moçambicanas e dos Estados Unidos no setor de gás natural liquefeito. As nossas reformas políticas, econômicas e de governação no setor empresarial abriram caminho para a aprovação do segundo compacto de Millennium Challenge Corporation, MCC. Queremos operacionalizar todos os instrumentos de cooperação que assinamos com os Estados Unidos incluindo o memorando que de entendimento para negócios nos dois sentidos, assinado no Maputo. Estes acontecimentos oferecem imensas oportunidades de negócios e convido aos parceiros de negócios a tirarem pleno proveito do ambiente de investimento em Moçambique. É nossa estratégia conduzir o combate à pandemia, abrindo a economia, de modo a tornar sustentável a gestão da resposta à Covid-19. Por isso, estamos empenhados em assegurar que Moçambique continue a ser um destino importante de investimentos, agora e depois da pandemia. Com essas minhas palavras introdutórias, agradeço a todos pela atenção que me dispensaram e agora disponho-me a responder qualquer pergunta que possam ser colocadas. Well, thank you, Mr. President, so much uh, for those words. Uh, they are greatly appreciated. Uh, I could start with the first question. Uh, what lessons have you learned uh, so far about the country's response to uh, the COVID-19 virus? Can you repeat, please? Sure. What lessons have you learned so far okay, okay. about your country's response to COVID-19? Nós aprendemos muito até desta pandemia, que não estivemos todos nós preparados. Primeiro, estamos a resolver um binômio. Binômio de saúde e da economia. Porque se nós avançarmos só no sentido de saúde, podemos, o nosso sistema pode colapsar, porque não teremos capacidade suficiente mais tarde para sustentar a gestão da própria pandemia. Eh, à medida, a arma principal que nós encontramos e que influenciamos os nossos concidadãos é a prevenção. A prevenção, estamos a disseminar mensagens claras em línguas locais, através de imagens, em todos os momentos, para podermos dizer à nossa população, aos moçambicanos, o que tem que fazer em cada momento. É verdade que este processo exige uma liderança forte e pronta, uma ação coordenada a nível do nosso governo, mas posso dizer aqui que se todo mundo estiver unido nesta pandemia a ações coordenadas, e até, por exemplo, nós aqui na região da SADEC, os países com que limitamos, poderá ajudar melhor, porque é uma doença que praticamente, como se diz, não anda, é carregada por pessoas e é entregue a outra ou recebe de uma outra pessoa. A adoção das medidas necessárias deve ser acompanhada, neste caso, de mecanismos apropriados para garantir esse, esse cumprimento, é, porque o impacto não é só no setor de saúde, o cuidado que estamos a ter, a outra lição, é, segundo a sua pergunta, é que temos que ter o Sistema Nacional de Saúde a funcionar e capaz, capaz de atender. E os cuidados que estamos a ter é, sempre que existem pandemias, é preciso garantir que não cheguemos à fase de colapsar o sistema, o Sistema Nacional de Saúde. Nós temos tido aqui a malária, temos tido aqui a tuberculose, são doenças que nos dão o alinhamento de como nós temos que conviver com essa doença. Nós temos aqui que garantir a segurança adequada aos grupos mais vulneráveis, que esses aqui que precisam de apoio imediato, porque a imunidade não foi... A, a, muito tempo consolidada no seu organismo, por isso mesmo que temos tido 
essa cuidado. A nossa parceria com o setor privado, nacional e internacional, ajudou bastante a recolher informações e não só algumas contribuições para a comunidade empresarial que são dados para como, por exemplo, produtos para a higienização e outras medidas. E, e na minha intervenção inicial, eu indiquei que pretendíamos continuar o processo de reformas de governação em todos os níveis. E, e neste caso, as nossas ações são orientadas pelo programa quinquenal do nosso governo. Não perdemos o foco, mas neste caso temos que saber, em paralelo, guiar esta doença, gerir esta doença, mas sem perder o foco de produção em Moçambique. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Uh, the next question that I would have for you is, what policies are you developing to strengthen resiliency in the health sector and the economy for the future? Bom, uh, este é extremamente importante porque nós, Moçambique, não será o mesmo país. Eu acredito que eh, todo o mundo vai ser assim. Nós temos que criar condições para o novo normal aquilo que nós dizemos, o novo normal. E, e ficou claro que o investimento para a saúde não pode ser negligenciado, e também, mas contudo, é preciso que essa saúde assegure a produção, porque as duas coisas são totalmente interligadas. Moçambique continuará a ser um destino apetecível no investimento por exemplo, no turismo e todos os outros. É claro que a economia do país terá um impacto negativo neste momento e, portanto, precisaremos de introduzir alguns ajustes fiscais e monetários necessários capazes de tornar resiliente a, a nossa economia. Porque, neste momento, as pequenas e médias empresas estão a operar com alguma dificuldade. Então, precisarão de ser injetados alguma força que lhes permita a sua reanimação. Naturalmente, nesse sentido, reanimação, no sentido que, com a sua produção, irão encontrar uh, os passos seguintes, porque neste momento estão quase que parados. Avaliaremos os efeitos da medida de mitigação, que estamos, agora a introduzir, que estamos agora a introduzir, e continuaremos a criar capacidades no setor de saúde, expandindo, expandindo o acesso e melhorando a qualidade. E, pois, os principais impulsionadores da recuperação serão, naturalmente, os setores que identificamos, nos casos prioritários para Moçambique, a agricultura e toda a cadeia de valor da agricultura, a energia, neste caso, que será estimulada com gás natural e de efeito. O outro setor importante que irá dinamizar a economia é o turismo nas zonas do interior e ao longo da costa marítima e as infraestruturas. No setor de transporte, na época da Covid, acrescentamos um fetor importante agora no, ao, ao revitalizarmos a cabotagem. O nosso país é longo, tem por volta de 2.700 km da, da costa, o que significa que eh, a assistência com a cabotagem que introduzimos agora, que passa pelos portos ao longo do país, esse irá também facilitar e alavancar o escoamento de mercadorias, principalmente de produtos agrícolas, não só para alimentar os portos principais que devem exportar para, para fora. A reabertura da economia a que me referi oferecerá à comunidade empresarial muitas oportunidades para investir e fazer trocas comerciais. Continuaremos também a procurar formas de ajudar as pequenas e médias empresas como o Mirafri, continuaremos a incentivar parcerias entre empresas moçambicanas e estrangeiras, e neste caso onde se encontra, claro, imediatamente o papel das empresas, das empresas americanas, que continuam, e de igual modo continuaremos com as parcerias bilaterais e multilaterais, com vista a fortalecimento e expansão da nossa cooperação para o desenvolvimento, os Estados Unidos, neste caso, são os parceiros estratégicos, por isso que esse encontro para nós é de extrema importância. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the next question would be, what will be different in Mozambique post-COVID-19? Because I know here in the United States, just operationally for businesses, it's going to be dramatically different. What are you seeing? Bom, uh... O setor privado em Moçambique, 
a África e mesmo os Estados Unidos, continuarão a desenvolver um papel fundamental no período pós-Covid. Muitas empresas já estão em Moçambique envolvidas, diferentemente em muitos setores, e então nós teremos que consolidar e continuar a carinhar e facilitar o seu trabalho, reduzindo tanto a muita burocracia que possa existir, tanto as condições de realização de negócios para Moçambique terão que ser facilitadas para alavancarmos isso. Os projetos do gás vão trazer transformações em termos de oportunidades de negócios na sua cadeia de valor e neste caso nós aqui em Moçambique temos privilegiado o conteúdo local. Todas as empresas estrangeiras que operam em Moçambique são apeladas para trabalhar com o conteúdo local, para alavancar a capacidade interna, sobretudo criar a capacidade no setor privado nacional. Mesmo agora que estamos a enfrentar a Covid-19, os contatos não pararam, continuam, e continuamos a receber até pedidos de informações de empresas africanas e também dos Estados Unidos, que estão a discutir projetos em curso e outros projetos em perspectiva. Portanto, isso oferece-nos a segurança de que as coisas irão continuar. O nosso governo está a trabalhar, e de uma forma contínua, para responder a essas solicitações, indicando exatamente o que, que o governo oferece e o que, que o setor privado pode oferecer também. As nossas embaixadas em todo o mundo, incluindo em Washington, D.C., continuam a trabalhar sob condições impostas pela pandemia, mas fornecem informação, não pararam, mas podem ser, como digo, contactadas a qualquer momento. A vantagem é que as tecnologias de informação e comunicação permitem que nos possamos reunir virtualmente, aliás, é o que está a acontecer agora. Nós esperamos que, entretanto, que o setor privado seja mais proativo em conjunto e possamos refletir sobre qual seria a melhor forma de trabalhar nesta nova fase. É uma fase que exige muita disciplina, disciplina laboral, é uma fase que exige muita coordenação. Em todo o caso, como disse, Moçambique está a trabalhar para o novo normal, porque já não será aquilo que nós conhecemos no passado, o novo normal será mais exigente e nós também teremos que acompanhar e conviver com esta realidade. Obrigado. Well, thank you again. Uh, the, the, the next question for you is, what will be the main drivers of the recovery and what are the implications for business in Mozambique? Está uh, falando sobre... Oh, well, é muito simples isso, porque o que eu falei vai isso em de acordo. O que vai impulsionar primeiro, nós temos a nossa economia direcionada com áreas tradicionais. E a principal área tradicional em Moçambique é a agricultura. Em Moçambique, a energia também tem um grande campo, porque não há energia que não possa ser produzida em Moçambique. É a gás, vamos ter capacidades acrescidas, temos muito carvão, o nosso país é drenado por rios, portanto, a energia hidro é feita com muita facilidade. Portanto, essas áreas todas, incluindo o turismo, vai impulsionar. Nós acreditamos que teremos que inventar o turismo de forma, de forma diferente, fazer com que esta própria pandemia nos trague a expectativa do que ficou. Essas áreas todas e as nossas políticas, as nossas políticas estamos a trabalhar no sentido de eh, como fazer negócios em Moçambique, como facilitar e também vamos impulsionar através de algumas facilitações que nós podemos ceder ao setor privado, porque algumas cedências terão que ser necessárias, porque é um setor privado que encontrou algumas dificuldades neste momento e para a sua reanimação precisa de alguns incentivos e só podem ser fiscais e todo tipo, outro tipo de incentivo. Portanto, esses pensamos que vai impulsionar. E neste caso concreto, com os Estados Unidos, já temos concretamente a linha de operação e queremos convidar também para esses outros fóruns novos, outras áreas onde a agricultura, por exemplo, pode ser muito alavancada aqui no nosso país. 
Well, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're down to our final question. Uh, what role can the United States and the private sector of, of Africa uh, play in Mozambique's post-COVID-19 recovery? É, não será diferente do que está a fazer. As empresas dos Estados Unidos estão em África e estão concretamente com alguma envergadura em Moçambique. Em Moçambique. E, e as áreas que, mais profundas que onde estamos a operar juntos são essas áreas de gás, mas também queremos nas áreas de infraestruturas. Eu sei, eu tenho estado, quando estou a falar sempre com, com a senhora Floria Lisa, tenho estado a dizer, por exemplo, a construção de pontes. A pontes, nós em Moçambique somos um país cíclico e pensamos que também é uma área que tem que ser explorada pelos Estados Unidos, neste caso concreto, na, nas infraestruturas. Porque muitas vezes, por exemplo, a agricultura nossa não evolui por falta de infraestruturas, barragens, o resto, aquilo que se sabe. Isso por quê? Porque Moçambique é um país seco no sul, muitas vezes, mas é muito úmido, ou chove mais no norte, mas nós não somos capazes de gerir essas águas quando chovem para poder sustentar a agricultura em todos os momentos. Portanto, as infraestruturas como estradas, aeroportos, neste caso portos até, e são fundamentais e, e nós queremos abrir essa, essa logo que estivermos em condições com alguma agressividade de trabalhar com os Estados Unidos, neste caso, para novos novos negócios, para não ficarmos só presos ao gás. Mas existem também que muitas oportunidades para se pôr para explorar. Is there anything specific that the U.S. government can do more for Mozambique? Sim, pode. Por exemplo, a experiência americana, incluindo na área de segurança, é fundamental. O meu país é um país que está a gerir alguns ataques e penso que a experiência americana nesse aspecto também de estabilização de Moçambique e joga um papel importante, está agora, faz parte do grupo de contato na pacificação de Moçambique, no âmbito do acordo de paz que foi assinado e os Estados Unidos faz parte. Portanto, essa é uma das áreas que estamos agora numa fase de nova era de descentralização, governação descentralizada. Pode apoiar nesta área, mas também pode estar a apoiar a área, por exemplo, de desarmamento, desmobilização e reintegração daqueles que ontem estiveram no mato a combater, a combater contra os irmãos. A fase está a ocorrer, mas também os Estados Unidos pode fazer muito nisto, acompanhar, apoiar, acarinhar o processo, porque onde, onde duas partes se confrontaram ontem, é normal que a terceira parte colabore para poder pacificar. E tem estado a fazer bem isso. Eu quero agradecer os Estados Unidos nesse âmbito e pedir que continue com esse esforço, porque todos os projetos econômicos de que me referi, após, agora e após Covid-19, exigirão a paz, a estabilidade, e só assim nós podemos aperfeiçoar. E os nossos, as nossas relações com os Estados Unidos justificam os investimentos, grandes investimentos que estão a ser feitos aqui em Moçambique pelos Estados Unidos, não autoriza para que o país esteja em, em conflitos ou em guerra. Temos que estar em paz para podermos produzir para os nossos povos, através do setor privado, neste caso. Excellent words, uh, Your Excellency. So, uh, we finished our questions. Uh, if you would like to have any moments for uh, some final remarks, uh, please, you can have the floor and talk. Bom, eu quero, como mensagem final, reiterar o nosso sincero apreço à senhora Florian Lizé e, e ao CCA, porque sempre contou conosco que nós queremos continuar a ser parceiros, que juntos colaboramos e, e fazer a política diferente. Nós, juntamente com o governo, nós estamos a facilitar e apoiar o setor privado. 
e o setor privado é esse que evolui, desenvolve os países. E por isso mesmo digo que quero saudar essa oportunidade que, que, que nos deram mais uma vez para partilharmos a nossa visão. Nós continuaremos disponíveis para reforçar as nossas parcerias com os Estados Unidos e gostaria de agradecer a si como moderador, fantástico moderador que nós hoje tivemos. Espero que a próxima vez que tivermos a sessão em Marocco ou outro lado qualquer seja de novo convidado e espero ver lo também em Moçambique, Moçambique no tempo livre ou mesmo em trabalhos. E eu tenho o conhecimento que a sua empresa é muito boa para o desenvolvimento de infraestruturas e é por isso mesmo que se olhou, fiz uma grande referência às infraestruturas porque aqui há espaço para desenvolver a sua atividade econômica. E muito obrigado mais uma vez pela atenção que nos deram e a minha querida amiga continue com força é assim que a mulher mostra que pode dirigir o setor e influenciar a economia do mundo. Obrigado. That's fabulous. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. President. We are just so honored that you would take time from your very busy schedule uh, to join us. And you've been so generous with your time today. We appreciate uh, you and uh, we welcome your very insightful remarks. And I just have to say that CCA is um, so pleased that we are a partner with Mozambique in focusing on greater uh, US Mozambican uh, trade and investment. Uh, and uh, thank you again for hosting us last year during the US Africa Business Summit, where we talked about the broader US Africa uh, relationship. Uh, we appreciated so much your hospitality then. So thanks again for joining us today for our Leaders Forum. And we look forward to staying in touch and continuing to be a strong partner of uh, Mozambique. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, thank you so much for moderating this session. Um, we appreciate that uh, Acro Bridge uh, uh, is a, a member of CCA on our board and also the great work that you're doing, doing all across uh, the continent in, in building needed infrastructure. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about what you'll be doing in Mozambique, as well as uh, in other countries on the continent. So uh, Bill, Your Excellency, President Niusi, uh, thank you again for being a part of CCA's Leaders Forum. Thank you so much, Flori. Thank you. You are welcome again to Mozambique. Thank you, Mr. President. So we will now transition to our high level panel discussion. Uh, we had a great discussion and on day one yesterday, and we have such incredible people who have agreed to be a part of our panel discussion today. I am just so looking forward to it. Let me turn um, to uh, our moderator for the panel discussion, my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Whitney Schneidman, who's a senior advisor for Africa at Covington and Burling, and is also a CCA board member. Uh, but before I turn it over to Whitney, um, I just wanna go over some housekeeping rules for the question and answer period uh, that, that will come uh, during the panel. Please use the Zoom chat function to send us your questions. Um, we will only take questions from those who provide their names. Please provide your full name, first and last name, and your affiliation when you send in a chat question. And uh, the panel is so great. I'm hoping we'll get a chance to have additional questions from you, but please do send them and we'll do our best to uh, try and get those to the panelists to respond to. So Whitney, uh, over to you. Lori, thank you so much uh, for having me uh, to moderate this uh, panel. Congratulations uh, on this um, uh, Leaders Forum. I mean, I think you really uh, use this time of challenge in a very creative and innovative way. So thank you to you and the whole CCA staff for um, not skipping a beat. Yes, we wish we were in Morocco, but the bottom line is that we're still together here and we're still focused on, on, on very important issues. It's, it's, it's my pleasure to be able to uh, <clears throat> moderate this very distinguished panel. Um, we have uh, with us uh, today, uh, Farid Fez Fezwala, 
who is president and CEO of uh, GE Africa. We have the uh, Honorable Betty Mina, who is Cabinet Secretary, uh, Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise uh, Development of Kenya. We have Gregory Roxon, who is the co-founder and CEO of M Pharma. And we have uh, Jim Winkler, who's the Vice President and Senior Director for Economic Growth uh, at Creative uh, Associates. So I invite them all to uh, turn on their cameras and, and, and we can get um, right into this. I, I should just say, you know, that, that we at Covington, I have, I've, I've been at Covington almost a decade. I have the honor to chair the Africa practice there. We have a very robust uh, life sciences practice. We have about 100 attorneys who are involved in Africa across our 13 offices, including our office in um, Johannesburg. So we've been able to work with a number of companies um, uh, over the years, but this is a particular time. So Fareed, let me start with you. And um, as president and CEO of GE Africa, I'm aware that there's some, you know, several thousand people uh, that, that you're responsible for in, in maybe 16 countries. And I think my first question is, you know, what have you taken away from the last four months? How have you been able to, to continue to provide the valuable services that uh, you do and that you do provide to your clients? And, 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 and what lessons have you learned so far? Thanks, uh, Whitney. And uh, let me just maybe start by, you know, the GE purpose statement that actually we just um, <clears throat> kind of uh, redefined, which is we rise to the challenge of building a world that works. So if you, if you think of that purpose in the context of COVID, it's been really, you know, um, a real mission to make sure that we deliver both for our employees and for our customers throughout the, the crisis. And, and I, I would say post COVID and considering some of the, you know, sanitary, but also socioeconomic consequences and implications of COVID, uh, there will be even more to do. You know, the, the first priority for us um, is the health and safety of our employees, but it's also the safety of our customers. So if we reflect uh, on the past three months, basically, and particularly in the, in the context of Africa, we really had to adapt very fast and establish new safety protocols uh, particularly for our employees in the front lines. And, you know, we, we often talk about the front lines and hospitals being where people are treated. Um, our front lines are, are really our field engineers, uh, the hundreds of uh, commercial staff, technical, clinical, clinical specialists uh, who have to be on site every day uh, to support hospitals, clinician, power utilities, airline companies, that truly within that period, if you look at the sectors of health, energy and infrastructure, as well as airline, uh, which is really the businesses and the sectors we play in and we've played in, had to deliver critical services. Um, and uh, if I look at some of the things we, we had to do, GE has traditionally been very uh, rigorous on its uh, environment, uh, health and safety protocols. But here we were caught into a very specific situation. And, uh, you know, from providing personal protection equipment to our employees, and in many cases also, you know, to our customers and customers, uh, employees, uh, going through a deep risk awareness training and communication to our workforce. It's also been about adapting in terms of anything that you could not do physically on site, you know, whether it's in a power plant, whether it's in a hospital, um, whether it's on a plane, you had to do it remotely. And, you know, remote working for our employees, but also for our customers has been a, a, a kind of paradigm shift uh, we had adopted digital and remote working for a while, 
But I think COVID put us in real situations and leveraging digital tools in this regard has been key. Um, it's also about leadership. And I, I, I want to insist on that. We've seen a lot of our um, uh, political leaders across the continent taking, and President Newsy was, was here taking the lead and driving very tough decisions, uh, implementing tough measures and actions. Well, we had to do the same within GE, you know, establishing very strong processes within our crisis management plan to track, anticipate. It's, a, it's about taking proactive actions across our businesses in Africa on, on key matters, such as how do you deal with quarantine, uh, repatriation, evacuation, site management, and uh, working closely with the authorities and, uh, and embassies throughout the continent. So. I would stop there. We could continue maybe on, on what we do for our customers, Whitney, but I'll, I'll give it back to you. Let me do one quick follow-up. You made reference to the paradigm shift and, and remote working, which I think all of us have had to do. The fundamental issue is you know, the internet and, and how has that been working for your, your colleagues and your employees and your clients um, over Africa? Has it yeah. been sufficient? Yeah, Whitney, that, that's an excellent question. And I think what we've, and for me personally, as I reflect, you know, we've created our G digital within solutions for the last 10 years and, and really driven that as the next step of, you know, our digital industrial transformation. But what we've seen during COVID is really that we've seen an acceleration by force of what I would qualify as affordable, but simple digital and remote support solutions. Mm. We've seen that in health when it comes to supporting remotely clinical staff, because when you cannot go into a hospital because COVID-19 risk of transmission are so high that you do not want, or you cannot necessarily expose your employees and similarly expose your customers' employees, you have to deploy some uh, digital support solutions. It's the same, and I would say even more critical when it comes to service and maintenance. At the end of the day, we are a technology company and you know, we know what a ventilator in, a critical, in an ICU suite is. We know what an ECG and a monitoring system is. But if it fails, you, know, you have to deploy people or you have to leverage digital tools to fix it immediately. You have to be proactive so that those systems that are supporting critically the life of patients in a hospital do not fail at any time. And, and that's the kind of solution. I will take a few examples. If you look at, you know, G Healthcare, uh, we, we recently launched um, a, a system, a software, which is called Thoracic Care Suite. It's basically a collection of eight artificial intelligence algorithm that are embedded into our X-ray, a digital X-ray that you know can be used on any digital X-ray. It's really the leveraging a software and artificial intelligence to be able to accelerate and automatically analyze images and the presence of abnormalities in, in the thorax and in, in the patient chest. So if you think about COVID, it was absolutely critical to detect very early on patients that will show abnormalities. But it's not only fast, it's about volume. And AI, artificial intelligence, and that kind of solution enable you to scan a lot of patients at one time and enable a radiologist to make a diagnostic very fast. But I reflect on Africa with those solutions and that's all in the realm of digital and artificial intelligence. You know, we all know Africa has, you know, 25% of the disease burden of the world. So COVID-19 is just adding to this, uh, but it only has 3% of the global healthcare professionals. Right. If you think about TB, um, that, you know, I think the World Health Organization estimates that that is about 1.8 billion people throughout the world that are infected by TB. 
And it's a major burden in Africa. So applying these kind of solutions, not only to COVID, which is pneumonia uh, uh, related, but also TB, that is uh, an aggravating factor in this situations is, is something you can reflect on. I, I would also take a, another example of what we've done in power. You know, a power plant is critical. You know, if electricity doesn't flow, and I think uh, His Excellency New C touched on this, in times of lockdown, if your power plant does not deliver electricity, first your hospitals, coming back to your hospital, would not work, which right. is a, a big problem in itself. And we've been able, you know, if I, I reflect in Cote d'Ivoire, we have a big partner called Ciprel that has, you know, uh, independent power uh, stations. And we were able to deploy digital monitoring solutions to ensure as the power plant, you know, needed more capacity and more monitoring to make sure that at no time this power plant fails. And that's some examples of, you know, the paradigm shift in terms of the use and leverage of digital um, to, uh, to really supplement capacity. Also being able to flex capacity because what you've seen in COVID, yeah. and that was very critical in, in healthcare, is that you had a surge of patients with limited infrastructure and means and capacity to deal with. Right. Right. And digital should be able to expand and flex this capacity Thanks. in the years to Thanks. come. It, it, it sounds like it's wonderful to hear that you've been able to sort of adapt, as you say, in, in the digital space. Let me turn to, um, to you, Cabinet, uh, Cabinet Sec Secretary Mina, uh, and just um, sort of blend two critical issues. You know, the first is the very important U.S.-Kenya trade agreement that both governments are, are embarking on. This is the most significant legislation or proposed legislation since the passage of, of the African Growth and Opportunity Act in, in, in 2000. But bringing it to COVID, how are you, how do you envision using this legislation to get pharmaceutical companies to come invest in Kenya so that we can expect to see more vaccine equity, see more production of the medicines that, that Africa needs, see these medicines actually manufactured on the continent so they can be uh, distributed more um, readily. So we'd love to hear your thoughts um, uh, about that. Over to you, thank you. You're, you're on mute. Um, thank you very much, Whitney. And uh, thank you very much, Flory, for the, first of all, putting this together and for the invitation to join uh, this uh, panel. Uh, President Newsy touched on uh, one of those realities that has come to us with COVID, which is uh, the need for uh, greater self-sufficiency when it comes to medical capacities. I think the whole world was hit by COVID at the same time, and we saw a disruption of supply of um, uh, very uh, required medical commodities. So it's important that as we come out of COVID, we start to think about local supplies. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. I would give you a glass of water. That, 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 yes, I, I, I go on. Good, 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 good. good. Every time anybody coughs these days, uh, anybody around you, you know, takes a beeline for the door because they always think he must be ill. But I think what, uh, just building on what I'm trying to say is that I think it's important as we go forward that countries build some level of security around uh, medical commodities and medical, medical supplies. And uh, one of our plans as a country is to build this capacity. We've been very, very energized by the response of the local business community in supply of uh, personal protective equipment, the supply of masks. Uh, we have some innovations around ventilators that um, are coming along fairly well and are quite, are quite exciting. So I think going forward, we would obviously, and it's one of our um, planks 
of the COVID recovery strategy is to build greater capacity with, in regard to pharmaceuticals and medical, uh, medical supplies. Uh, the US uh, and Kenya free trade agreement provides an opportunity for us to uh, create a much more predictable environment for investment uh, by companies that supply these goods. And we hope that uh, in the negotiations that we are embarking on uh, in July, that we'll be able to pay great attention uh, to such, uh, such, such investments other countries have used uh, the free trade agreements uh, between themselves and what we've used in the region to expand uh, possibilities of investment because uh, investors such as GE do not want to come uh, to a closed market of 50 million alone. I think the regional market provides great promise and possibilities of um, investing with a view of the US market is also quite attractive for us. So we're going into these negotiations, you might have had a chance to look at our objectives. But we're going into these negotiations with a great intention of uh, creating an environment where we can attract a greater investment. One of the nascent areas is uh, uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine production. We are in conversations with some companies right now. Right now, they're not, um, I don't think there's some American companies. I think they're German uh, companies partnering uh, with our local companies. And we're actually going into conversations about possibilities of production uh, of um, at least, or even just uh, the final assembly of vaccines uh, in Kenya, which is doubly necessary in our case. Our middle income status as a country means that in a few years time, will not be eligible for some of the Gavi support uh, that has made uh, vaccines available. So I think for us, there's actually an added urgency uh, in this matter. And therefore we are looking forward to uh, partnerships with American companies and partnerships with other companies in order to deepen our footprint in uh, production of medical supplies and we want to promise them uh, the larger East African and African markets because of the Africa continental uh, free trade area. Thank you. All right, so just let me follow up for a second, uh, Cabinet Se Secretary. So then you would envision that with this free trade agreement, it would be a springboard to US investment, not just in Kenya, but in, in East Africa as, as well. And you see other countries benefiting from this. Yes, um, I, I, I don't think anybody would set up in Kenya just for Kenya alone. I think they set up in Kenya because of the regional market. But the free trade agreement provides a predictable framework for that uh, investment. I think, as you have mentioned before, um, the, the biggest deal for Africa is the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, uh, which is set to expire in 20, uh, 2025, uh, the US government, when uh, Flory was there, uh, signaled quite loudly that it would not be uh, extended. There may yet be some change of mind, but we haven't gotten that indication. So I think it is in the interest of US companies, as well as uh, the Kenyan government and others to uh, use uh, this French agreement as a, as, as a signal of stability in the in the trading environment. And I think the promise that Kenya provides is its regional networks, the Africa continental free trade area, which we are part of, the East African community can provide certainty for the African market for these US companies, but it also provides an opportunity to uh, build up supply chains outside the US uh, in a country such as Kenya. Great, great. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let me shift over now to um, Gregory uh, uh, Roxon in uh, Ghana. And, and Gregory, let me ask you, you, you are the co-founder and CEO of M Pharma, um, a life sciences company that is sort of the embodiment of what we're talking here. You profiled last week in the uh, Financial Times uh, 
in an article entitled Private Sector Drives Africa's Fight uh, Against the Virus. And uh, I understand that your company in pharma established Ghana's first private COVID-19 testing lab. So, so the first question I'd, I'd like to ask, um, I, I think Fareed made um, reference to uh, the fact that you know, Africa has only reported about 2% of global infections, yet your company is on the front line of providing testing. What are you seeing in terms of the, the ability of, of African governments to test? Is the data that, that uh, the WHO in the region Afro, is, is Afro's data accurate or are we, or is there just so much going on that we don't see? Um, what's your sense of, of what the data is telling you? Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I mean, a continent of over a billion people, we've not done more than 10 million tests. So mm -hmm. I think that is the, the data points that we should be looking at. We are uh, hopefully uh, uh, under testing, uh, which is really a very boring concern simply because if we cannot test, we cannot really understand the, 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 the rate of community spread. And we've seen um, that a sort of a change in the disease bed and moving from important cases to right now, the biggest form of spread being community transmission, right? And with community transmission, it means we have to be able to quickly identify um, and isolate uh, 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 people that get into contact with the virus, right? So not only do we have a problem with testing, we also have longer uh, wait uh, time because of um, excess demand to get results back. Now, there's no use of the test results when you do a test and you get the results back in seven days. I mean, in seven days, you would have spread as much as you, you, you want. And that's what we are seeing, unfortunately. Uh, there was a statistics from South Africa that showed that you know, the testing uh, 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 return in South Africa in the public sector was over seven days, but in the private sector, it was less than two days. So I think it just tells you the role that the private sector can play. At M Pharma, one of the first things that we saw, and that was back in February, we realized seeing the growth of cases in, 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 in Europe um, and also in the US, we asked ourselves, what if we had that explosion of cases um, in Africa? Like, how could we actually help improve the rate of testing? So we quickly began mobilizing uh, support from molecular diagnostic companies. And we used our, our Ghana warehouse infrastructure as a, as a holding bay to be able to move in uh, test kits and equipment so that in case it happened, I mean, back then Ghana had less than 20 cases, right? So it was sort of a bold bet that, you know, we're gonna see an explosion of cases. And we used um, our, our supply chain infrastructure in Ghana. So this holding bay uh, uh, to build a coordinated supply chain um, um, response should that happen. I think it's a good example of what the private sector could do. And by April, we had seen an explosion in cases and we were able to leverage the sort of supply chain infrastructure that we had built in Ghana to send close to 800,000 test kits to about half a dozen African countries um, um, and equipment. So as it stands now, I think we are the early stages of, uh, of COVID-19 on the continent. And it's hard to actually tell how bad it is simply because um, the data that we are getting is from a very, very small uh, 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 base of people that are being tested. And we need to be able to do more tests to be able to understand what we are actually facing as a continent. Right. It's, it's quite a, a sobering number, 10 million tests and 1.2 billion people. But let me ask you, you sort of have been able to do what few uh, countries and not too many governments have been able to do, and that is sort of put together the international supply chain to bring in uh, the PPE equipment and, and other test kits that um, are necessary. As you just said, you sent them on to uh, other countries as well. Are, are, are you expanding that capability? Do you sort of see this as a, um, a vital area for uh, M Pharma to grow and, and to be a real uh, supplier to the continent of the necessary uh, uh, equipment? Definitely. I think the key lesson for me in this is that we cannot continue to react only in moments of crisis. Because when you wait for crisis in order to start to think about building critical infrastructure, 
at that point in time, everyone wants the same thing, right? And unfortunately, you cannot get what everyone wants if you are also the lowest buyer, right? So I'll give a good example. You know, back in, 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 in February, when we were negotiating, um, um, you know, trying to negotiate contracts to get test equipment and test kits. I mean, we were able to leverage relationships uh, with some of our shareholders to be able to get access, right? I remember one day trying to uh, you know, you know, you know, sign a contract and you know, wire money to get um, stuff in place. And a European country sending a military plane to that company to pick up all the equipment and test uh -huh. kits, right? Uh -huh. I mean, how, how can you outbid the EU? You probably you really cannot outbid the EU if, for example, you're the African Union, right? You're probably getting money from the EU. So I think what we need to do is to take a step back as a, as a, as a, as a, as a continent, really, to ask ourselves, how do we begin to build that critical infrastructure that is needed to prevent the next pandemic? Right. And what that means for me really is that, you know, or what I hope it doesn't lead to is a situation where every country starts manufacturing the same thing. I think we actually have a great opportunity to create a regional alliance where every regional box says, you know what, maybe East Africa should focus on making you no, know, no, you no, know, medicines. Maybe West Africa should focus on making, you know, you no, know, no PPEs. Maybe Southern Africa should focus on making this. And then we have actually an agreement which clearly dictates what every block can do so that when it actually comes to this situation, we can trade amongst each other because when it gets to a point where everyone is making the same thing, everyone wants to sell what they've made and then we all have excess of one thing and we all lack um, um, other infrastructure. So I think we've got to take a step back using the Africa Free Trade um, uh, Agreement to actually begin to make allocations and decide how that allocations will be made in terms of what every regional block should be manufacturing. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to come back to that um, in a second, but but let me go to Jim Winkler because Jim, you've had such great experience on the continent. You've worked with the uh, Trade and Investment Hub in East Africa, the Trade and Investment Hub in Southern Africa, and now you're in West Africa, and you've seen so many, so many African businesses and so many U.S. businesses um, in the market. What is your takeaway? What kind of response and what kind of innovations are you seeing to what President uh, Inusi rightly said that productivity has come to a halt, not just on the continent, but here in the United States and, and, and elsewhere. Whitney, thanks for that question and uh, the discussion among my panelists. Um, you know, this is a horrible time. Call it a crisis. It's a time of danger and opportunity. The danger is many countries in Africa were looking at positive growth rates, GDP growth. Now they're all looking at negative, with maybe the exception of Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire. So there's a deep hole with the economy shut down. In spite of the shutdown, what's remarkable is that many businesses, especially in services and that are digital enabled, continue to function. We're having this conference. Uh, this can reach more people than the in-person U.S. Africa Business Summit that CCA holds, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we are seeing, I think, digital solutions and transformation and awareness um, among political and business leaders that we can do things now that maybe we didn't even imagine before. The pandemic has woken us up. And when you're in an existential crisis like this one, as a small business, which makes up over 70% of the economies in Africa and most of the world, you either die or you survive. And so many businesses that are producing with a market shutdown are just holding tight and trying to hold themselves together until the economy opens up. But other businesses are looking for working capital and um, other uh, kinds of financing, trade finance, so that they can sustain their operations. And that's one of the things that the United States as a partner to Africa, I think is bringing to the table here. I wanna mention the BUILD Act. US Congress passed the Better Utilization of Investment Leading to Development. That's a BUILD Act that has increased the uh, assets from 29 billion to $60 billion that the US International Development Finance Corporation can now deploy into the continent. And we're seeing in West Africa, a new model of how US aid and USG agencies are doing this. We're managing that process in the trade hub. 
where we have a $60 million facility for grants from $250,000 to $2 million that we deploy with individual companies. Now, this is a drop in the bucket, call it a pilot compared to $60 billion. But for $60 million, we are piloting and testing how we can achieve a min minimum of five to one leverage, $300 million in new investment from the private sector, $240 million in exports and trade, and 40,000 new jobs, half for women. I think we can far exceed that. We're seeing some fascinating examples. For example, we're working uh, with an impact investor in West Africa to take a grant as a first loss, $2 million combined with the investors, one and a half. So three and a half million dollars creates a first loss facility. The Development Finance Corporation brings in a 50% guarantee on top of that. And we can get a leverage effect of 20 to one. So a $40 million fund is created out of a $2 million grant that we provide, taking the best innovation and structuring of private capital to then on lend, run by a fund manager to 40, 50, 80 or more small and medium enterprises. Another great example is uh, we're working with the International Finance Corporation on a digital scale up for working capital specifically to respond to this pandemic. And, and IFC is invested in three or four companies that have a digital platform that reach 10,000 to 40,000 companies in the formal and informal sector. So take one company that uh, uses a digital platform to reach micro transport companies. Many of them are informal. They're not registered, but they're absolutely essential to reach small villages and remote areas. And so this company will work with us to set up a special purpose vehicle where we'll do a similar um, fund mechanism that allows them to channel working capital into transactions across 10,000 micro fleet uh, companies that are providing transport and movement of goods, whether it's PPE or food or water or whatever is required in the marketplace. And so that's an example of a digital solution that the private sector is activating and mobilizing to respond to companies that usually don't even get seen in the informal sector, but make up half or 100% of the equivalent of GDP in most economies. Another example I'll mention is we're working with a US-Nigerian joint venture that has come to us, they wanna make a $13 million investment in Delta State, which has 30% of its water, uh, of the surface is water in that state. This joint venture believes that aquaculture, an integrated business model that produces feed and inputs for farmers, small farmers, can uh, produce tons of um, fish, catfish, at affordable prices, and that this model uh, can be replicated in Delta State, Cross River State, and across West Africa. So the comments have been made that too much food is being imported into Africa, and Africa is dependent on imported food. That needs to change. I was in Kaduna, Nigeria uh, last January, and we went to a point and kill restaurant where you get to pick your cat fish. They kill it, they grill it, and you eat it. And I'm sitting there with our Nigerian friends eating, you know, catfish grilled with beer on a beautiful night. And I asked, well, where did this catfish come from? They said, imported frozen from China. Now, that's because the production systems are not up and running on the cotton continent. So across agriculture, transport, you know, light manufacturing, a wide range of logistics and other services for both trade across the region, across the continent, and to the United States, investment and financing, which I think is a strategic industry that the US can bring to uh, Africa, is absolutely critical to transform these economies that haven't been able to reimagine what their industries should look like. And what the pandemic is doing, we heard this yesterday in the discussion. Before this pandemic, I would have guessed that it would take 10 to 20 years, honestly, for the uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement to take off. What you're hearing now from leaders, from the Honorable Sec Secretary and the Presidents that have spoken yesterday and today, they now realize how critical intra-regional trade is. In Europe and the U.S., intra-regional trade in those economies is 50% of total, you know, economic activity. In Africa, it's less than 10%. So the kinds of investments that we are doing in partnership with private firms that bring innovation and know-how that we as a 
private consulting firm in USAID and USG could never alone come up with is really inspiring in the middle of this pandemic. And we don't know when it's gonna end. We know that we're able to continue working because all of our work is online and digital for applications from companies to develop their proposals and co-create the solutions with them that uh, are gonna put people back to work and be able to rebound. This is very important. SMEs make up the backbone of the economy. We need to get working capital and trade finance available to them through the 40 plus financial institutions that we are talking to so that up and down the supply chains and across the economy, we'll be able to see these uh, companies be poised to rebound when things open up. So, so Jim, let me just ask you, you made reference to the US Development Finance Corporation, which I think all of us agree is a very important innovation uh, from our US Congress supported by the uh, uh, Trump administration. Are you seeing any specific targeting of investments in the health sector from the DFC? Yes, in fact, the DFC just announced recently in the past few days, a special um, program to target healthcare and health sector financing um, that will deploy both their debt and equity financing capabilities and their insurance and guarantees that leverage private sector investment tremendously. So when you we can take private capital that is risk averse because either there aren't bankable businesses and projects or the, uh, the risk is too high. DFC and the kinds of things we're doing with grant money to create structures for funds and for new projects that multinational businesses, US companies and African companies are willing to invest in is absolutely critical to deploy those capabilities, especially right now in the pandemic when PPE production you know, is required on the continent. And you know, many US companies like GE and, GE and others are able to bring that know-how and partner with African companies like Gregory's to figure out how do we reimagine these supply chains? You know, one interesting comment on supply chains, before the pandemic, global supply chains were highly efficient, but vulnerable to a shock like this. So for example, in West Africa right now, cashews are rotting in the fields because the traditional global supply chain that was efficient before the pandemic collected from farmers in West Africa, shipped to India or Vietnam, process them value addition in Vietnam and India, and then ship to the Europe and to the United States markets. Well, now we have an opportunity to rethink all that because investment into value addition, processing and manufacturing with a number of US firms in these uh, co-investment projects that we are, have in our pipeline will change and transform the ability of Africa across the continent from Kenya to Nigeria from Tunisia down to South Africa, where that processing and reinventing and shortening supply chains, not to take away value from others, but to create value and jobs and more economic dyna dynamism in the economies on the continent. I think that's an unexpected silver lining that we're seeing that people see the African Continental Free Trade Agreement really is critical. We need to recognize that like the pandemic, it doesn't respect borders. And so the discussion has been very heart, heartening that the discussion of collaboration, partnership, and working together to solve the uh, health, immediate health impacts, but also the secondary impacts of economic and health systems that need to be strengthened so that the economy and, and health systems are poised for rebounding and preparing for a next kind of pandemic or shock that is inevitable. And so that resiliency, I think, is now within our vision and now it's time to execute on it with the kinds of investments and collaboration with government, private sector, and donors like USA, DFC, and, and other development finance institutions and multilaterals. Great, great thank you. So um, we're going to get to some questions um, in a minute. I've got one eye on all the questions that coming in the chat room. There's sort of a number coming in from the more than 300 people that are uh, participating in this webinar, which, which is great. But before I get to this, I want to pivot to uh, to you, Honorable Cabinet Secretary, and pick up on a point that um, uh, Greg made, which I thought was a really interesting point, that, you know, ECOWAS and EAC and SADC should get together to figure out what their needs are in responding to COVID and, and these health issues. 
um, and, 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 and do it on a regional basis. And I'm just curious uh, about your response to that. I mean, is this, do you think that is a good idea? Is it happening? How is, how is, how is, the, how is the regional um, economic communities uh, working together to respond uh, to a pandemic like COVID? You're on, you have to unmute, thank you. Yes, uh, I, have, you know, I have obeyed the instructions a bit too much about muting while not speaking. I think the Africa continental free trade area offers a great promise. And I agree with Gregory that there should be some uh, form of you know, clarity and collaboration with regard to uh, the regional supply uh, supply chains. I think that is need, needs to be driven a lot also by, by the private sector because uh, industrial, industrial policy is by and large a national, I mean, it's a national mandate. It's, uh, we believe in the principle of subsidiarity and therefore a lot of these decisions are made at national level. But I think if there was also leadership from the private sector to signal uh, the relative, I uh, you know the partnerships that they would that they would that they would want to reach, then that can also temper uh, the desire because each country desires to be self-sufficient. Each country desires to build its industrial base. But if there was a great signal from the private sector about uh, their areas of specializations and comparative advantage that they have set for themselves, and that could also set the signal uh, for policy makers, because I agree, if everybody produces exactly the same thing, then before long, there'll be a, a, some clamor for protectionism, which uh, negates uh, the need for self-supply and would compromise uh, the desire to have fair you know, competitiveness and affordability. So I think it requires a partnership between the private sector and government in order to set uh, this signal because uh, the country and the continent, sorry, has great ambitions for uh, deepening. And I think there's even an Africa action plan on pharmaceutical, on, for the pharmaceutical sector. So this becomes an, an, an opportunity for this partnership and, uh, and, 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 and great collaboration. And, and, and how do you see the health of the partnership today? What, what kind of partnership exists between the government and the private sector in um, Kenya, for example? I was going to say it varies from country to country. Uh, Kenya has a very rich tradition of close collaboration between government and the private sector, and, uh, and, the, and the government is very sensitive to the input uh, of the private sector. A bit sometimes a bit so sensitive because I think there could be there could have, there, there's a lot of things we could have done with also a visionary uh, private sector that sees the larger. Uh, regional market and the larger continental markets so that and, and, and collaboration in that regard. But I'm afraid uh, not every country uh, has the sort of deep partnership between the private sector and government and there's a lot of government uh, direction in some areas. Right, right. Uh, yeah. um, Free, let me uh, let me go to you. Uh, you know, we, we've mentioned several times uh, this conversation about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. How does how does GE see this? How are you planning to take advantage of it? And um, uh, as number one, and some of the questions that have come in, you know, how does GE make its decisions on where to invest in a lab? You know, a testing lab in Uganda or you know some other countries when, when the needs are so great and let's face it, resources finite, how do you, you know, how do you land a decision? And particularly in the context of the uh, uh, emerging uh, regional free trade agreement. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very important point. I, I, I think both the honorable CS and, and Gregory were spot on. It's, um, well, first of all, I think reflecting from COVID we, we definitely need to be much more proactive than we've been in Africa. We cannot just wait for a disruption like this one, a pandemic or any other burden to just, you know, outline the gaps we have. Uh, 
Um, you know, I was just reflecting, we talked about vaccines, we talked about labs and testing, but you know, for a population of 1.2 billion people, there were only 18,000 ventilators. I mean, I'm just taking that because we've been, you know, before the crisis, nobody knew what a ventilator did really in a critical suite in a hospital. Today, everybody knows. So how could we have as countries, as private sector, not been able to build the capabilities and the capacity that could respond to such type of upheavals? So I think this is a, a big learning for us. And, and there are many ways we can respond to that. One is the big subject of supply chain. And if you look at a company like GE, and I agree with the honorable CS, unless you create a critical mass across the countries of Africa, you want, it's very difficult to ask a, a private sector company, technology company investors to really localize manufacturing in one place for a small market or relatively small market that still has a lot of constraints with regards to export, even to the neighboring country, to have tax agreement, customs agreement. Mm -hmm. And I think the African continent free trade agreement needs to bring that. Now, if I, if I reflect on what G does from healthcare technology, you know, first I would go back to 10 years ago. We took the bet in South Africa to build the first African locomotive. You know, we, we did, we created 60% integration in terms of production and integration in South Africa. And the purpose was really to produce that locomotive for the African continent. I think we could apply this to many other spaces. You know, um, if I think about airline, we have an industry today that is in a in a big, uh, uh, in a in a, I would say dire strait, but hopefully rebounding soon. But think about the open skies debate in Africa. You know, think about the champions we have. You know, whether it's the Ethiopian Airlines, the Kenya Airways of this world, why don't we capitalize as that as a continent and really build the center of excellence or to Greg's point, the champions that will do the few things that the, the continent needs. And I think if we do a good job to just, you know, bounce back on what Jim said about, and, and this is the CCA. So Prosper Africa is in our mind. We've got a a very strong willingness from the US government today to really, whether it's through bilateral free trade agreements like the Kenya ones and the promises we're seeing, or whether it's through supporting with financing and adapted financing. I think, you know, I've been in discussion with the DFC and MCC and USAID lately, and even the World Bank and the African Development Bank. And I can tell you there is a, a huge shift in the way those government agencies or multilateral are thinking. You know, it's about blended finance to make sure that we allow, you know, a grant element, Jim described some of that, both for the private sector, the public sector, or the public private partnership type of initiatives. And I think if we put the trans-African collaboration a private sector that is really brought to the table, at the table in those discussions, plus the government, the US government agencies, OECD government agencies, and multilateral coming to play to help, I think we can really do the job. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting to me in, in Prosper Africa, one of the concepts you keep hearing over and over again are deal teams. We don't quite yep. know what those deal teams are yet, but the fact that the U.S. is now thinking of them, I think, right. is a reflection of that of, of the mind shift that you were um, referring to. But um, Gregory, let me come over to you with with one of Farid's points, you know, about the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It looks like you've been able to get, you've been able to bring materials into into Ghana, and then sort of 
export them to other points um, in Africa pretty pretty effectively. So it doesn't look like they're maybe you've just been able to sort of um, navigate the barriers of trade uh, in, in ways that uh, seem to present challenges for, for other companies. But that's also part of a question that has come in in, 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 in the chat room about uh, business risk. And, and how, you know, what do you see for your company in this sector as, as the biggest risks? And how do you manage those? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, I mean, I would love to have said it was easy. <laughs> it was not easy. Um, and, you know, I think that at the end of the day, one thing I think it's important in trying to create an enabling environment is for governments to just set the rules and not try to pick specific winners, because then that ends up creating um, some sort of corporate favoritism that would not um, inspire um, um, foreign organizations to do more. I also think it's important to think about how African companies can be incentivized to invest in other African companies. I'll give you a good example. Um, you know, in Kenya, for example, Honorable Betty uh, may know this, M Pharma, we, almost, we wanted to buy our first pharmacy chain. We actually didn't buy it in Ghana, we're a Ghanaian company. We actually bought it in Kenya. Right. We bought our first pharmacy chain in Kenya. And that was a big investment that we made into the Kenyan market by acquiring the second biggest pharmacy chain um, in Kenya, Halton's. Um, and unfortunately, I'm un unable to travel there right now because of the, the, the border closures. Um, and, I, and so we hope that once the borders open, we, we can do more. But that was a good example of how a Ghanaian company left Ghana and went to Kenya saw an asset and bought that asset. Now, it was a very smooth process um, um, in making that happen. And I think the more our governments can talk about how African-led businesses, not just multinational companies, um, can be inspired to invest in other African markets, can help continue to create this regional integration. Um, and I believe that the greatest thing any government can do really right now is to not see the private sector as a threat but rather to see it as actually a partner. I think most African, well, I don't say most, but some African countries that we've had to work in have always seen the private sector as a threat. And there's sort of this idea to protect um, um, a small piece of something that if it was opened up could actually become better to benefit everyone. And that for me is the biggest ax that will make up any gap in the markets that we work in. And what do you, I mean, what steps can the private sector and government take together to overcome that perception of the private sector as a threat? So I'll give you a very good example uh, with COVID um, and testing. The initial wave of testing um, was being borne by, the, uh, by governments, but clearly government did not have the capacity to be able to provide as many tests as possible. Mm -hmm. I think South Africa was a good example of how the private sector could support uh, uh, public health emergencies. In the first wave in South Africa, over 90% of the tests being done were done by private labs, right? Because these private labs had invested in building the molecular diagnostics infrastructure that allowed them to be able to quickly respond while the government uh, then had to then build up uh, its own infrastructure to respond to this need. Um, some countries have not been open enough to do this. And, you know, uh, you know for example, it, we are waiting to be able to... Uh, uh, getting allowed to set up private testing in, 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 in Kenya, as an example, um, where we say we will come in. We don't want any handouts from the government, right? We will come in and we'll provide the infrastructure to do this. And I think when governments create that enabling environment, that rewards the private sector to take these risks um, uh, and not be very hands-on in terms of trying to... Um, you know, sort of drive uh, uh, away the private sector, that could be a great way to spur more investments in innovation that ends up benefiting everyone. That's great. So Jim, let me just um, stick with that uh, theme and, and, and go to you, given your experience working across the continent. What, what, what needs to be done to, to develop more trust between the private sector and African governments? That's, that's one part of the question. The second is, you know, the trade hubs work with African companies coming into the US exporting under 
for Goa, and also now helping U.S. companies coming into the market. When it comes to managing risk, is there is there similarity between the risks that African governments and American governments face um, on the continent and dealing with governments? You know, I think um, some of the U.S. Uh, African government officials that we've had conversations with in CCA when we've asked them, uh, one of the biggest problems for U.S. business is corruption. You know, and I like the response of uh, the head of the African Union who said, speak it out loud. Don't be afraid mm -hmm. to talk about the C word um, and bring it out into the open because we have to deal with it because the transparency and level playing field so that uh, business can have more confidence that decisions are being made on procurement, government procurements, or the way policies are made or deals are made are not back office deals that benefit a few individuals and doesn't be benefit, you know, the country, the people, and a fair in a fair competitive transparent process. So, I take heart in in that leadership courage to say, you know, we've got to do better. Um, and I think that's been an issue from uh, the U.S. side and the President's Advisory Council on doing business in Africa. They've raised that as a critical point. And I think African leaders. Uh, understand that that is increasingly more critical to attract U.S. investment and to build that stronger you know, partnership with the United States and uh, bring in the GEs and you know, the Caterpillars and the John Deere's and the companies big and small that are accustomed and, and expect to operate in that kind of modality. Um, on, on AGOA, I really you know, think that one of the problems has been that the lack of financing and investment has left African companies um, without the tools and the capabilities they need in their manufacturing, equipment, processes, quality standards, and relationships to be able to access the U.S. market. Trade finance, for example. You know, we've promoted um, uh, participation in trade shows at Magic for apparel, for example, in Las Vegas or the New York um, you know, food shows and, and floriculture in Chicago and so forth. And that's great, but to really expand, you know, the ability of Africa to increase value addition and compete in the U.S. market, capital is not just money. It's the partnerships with a U.S. buyer or investor, joint investor that an African uh, business or an entrepreneur can, can uh, generate, as well as the know-how of how to design products and be responsive to one of the most competitive markets in the entire world, which is the US market. And so the combination of capital, trade finance, working capital access, equipment, some of it is US equipment, sales of US technology and equipment into the continent to help African businesses build the apparel, you know, and other products, uh, food, processed foods, and so forth that can be exported under AGOA are all, I think, part of the equation that hasn't really happened in the past as much as it should have. So the tip of the spear, I think, now is finance and, and investment and everything from infrastructure, healthcare, processing, you name it, that uh, each of the countries need and be able to expand that marketplace within Africa also so that companies, U.S. companies coming in can help African partners trade. Right now, it's harder, it's hard to trade between Kenya and Uganda on some products because the standards have to be harmonized and you have as many obstacles sometimes to get that trade done as with the US or with uh, the EU. And that can be transformed in a positive way where you know grains from East Africa, when there is a surplus, we facilitated hundreds of millions of dollars in trade of grains from East Africa to Southern Africa when they had shortages and vice versa. And I think that's the opportunity and that's the real upside that we've seen happen in a facilitated way. We just need to structure the financing, the markets, the trade and so forth so that it can happen on a much more systematic and scalable, sustainable way. You know, I was, I was, uh, I participated in the first African investment forum in, um, in, in Johannesburg in January, 2019 that was sponsored by the African Development Bank. And I was quite struck when uh, the president of, of the bank, uh, uh, Dr. Deshima, said that, that the future of Africa is not development assistance. The future of Africa is investment, you know, a clear paradigm shift. 
So uh, Honorable Cabinet Secretary, I'd love to get your reaction to that uh, and your reaction to a number of the points that Jim just made about the need for financing, harmonization of standards, you know, what you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis to stimulate more local investment, more international investment, more investment from the U.S. and what we can do to help that actually in our, in our own capacities. I think there's no, yeah, I think that this I'm better now. I think there's no doubt that the business environment uh, determines uh, the security of investment in any country. And, uh, and that's something that Kenya and other countries have been working on. I think you've seen the great competition that countries engage in uh, with regard to the doing business ranking. But we've also come to the conclusion that the parameters and the indicators that we measure in the doing business indicators is not, is not enough. We actually need to work at other issues around uh, business friction and challenges uh, that business are facing. So that becomes you know, a top agenda, certainly for Kenya and I know it is for other countries. I'm certain President Kagame would probably have said something similar uh, yesterday. But as we move towards uh, regional uh, integration, it is important that we also harmonize uh, the standards. And that's something that we've been working on uh, within, uh, within East Africa. But I'll be the first to admit that one of the greatest uh, barriers to greater regional trade is actually the implementation of these harmonized, uh, harmonized standards because each country, and sometimes uh, in uh, uh, submitting to pressure from domestic investors, still have some rigid rules. So that becomes uh, a continued work in progress. A lot of the work that we're now starting to do and focus on in trade facilitation is really intended to smoothen and to eliminate uh, some of these barriers and uh, the use of technology uh, digital systems. In East Africa, we have a, an cargo tracking uh, system that is in uh, operation, especially in the northern, uh, what we call the northern corridor from Mombasa through Uganda to, uh, to Rwanda. And that has worked a lot to ease uh, clearance and prevent, you know, double inspection at each, uh, at, at, at each border. So that's is the response uh, uh, answering these questions in regional trade through uh, greater regional uh, integration standards and related matters are also matters that receive a, a lot of attention now uh, from from us i like to comment but i think on the issue around greater investment i think all of us expect and uh gearing ourselves to see uh, greater investment i think there's a limit to how much investment can come from the public sector. The public sector might have invested and has invested in infrastructure and in other social goods, but for active, uh, you know, productive investment, we expect that to come from the private sector. And we recognize that this private sector capital is not particularly patriotic. So it is important that we create uh, the environment for it to uh, thrive within, uh, within, within, within the region. And that's something that we're going to. So I think uh, answering your third question, I think from the US side, uh, it is important to first, uh, with all the investment uh, vehicles and investment uh, uh, products that are available, it's also important to uh, link that up uh, with greater support for the public sector uh, and the public sector institutions that are involved in trade facilitation, so that uh, there is a, at least there is a, there is a, both a supply side of investment, but it's also a supply side for the instruments that make it easier and make it uh, and make make it easier and uh, and, and make it more uh, create a more predictable environment for this uh, for, for for this for this investment. Yeah. Uh, uh, and just, just a quick question on the Kenya-Uganda border. What's the state of digitalization? I mean, are, are, is, do you, are goods moving across more quickly or? 
delay? Actually, no, we had goods moving across, uh, and, and that's the, 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 you know, the default position. The answer is that we actually have goods moving at ease, I mean, in terms of uh, with customs procedures. But we've had challenges, and that may be something that everybody has picked up uh, in the recent past. Uh, with regard to ensuring that it's also safe travel. Um, Kenya is an entry point for uh, Uganda and Rwanda and many other countries in the region. Uganda is a transit country. So uh, in recognition of the fact that a lot of COVID in the countries is uh, coming through uh, importation, the vector for importation of COVID in uh, Uganda might have come from cargo, cargo, on, uh, cargo, you know, car cargo truck drivers and we've had some challenges in ensuring that there's compliance but we've also had some challenges in uh, harmonizing uh, the testing and ensuring respect uh, for testing so that has led uh, to a pileup in an earlier conversation i had today uh, we've had holdups i mean we used to have border clearances in four hours or less but now we've had holdups that sometimes you know lead to uh, delays of up to 10 days as different parties uh, confirm uh, the compliance with the testing uh, requirements. But that's something that we are addressing on a, as a matter of emergency because it's also leading to um, delays in su supply of goods to the landlocked countries and that impacts on prices and that also causes greater distress. So it's, I think it's a matter of high priority to resolve uh, the regional framework for uh, testing and respect of the same. And that's something we've agreed on and working uh, with uh, Uganda and uh, especially Uganda and Rwanda, we also have introduced an app for um, uploading uh, the driver's health status, which great. hopefully will ease uh, clearance at the border. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. So, so we're running out of time. I think we have time for um, one more round here and, and, and I want to put to you a question that has come from um, Aisha Soronke who's with Barbersol and um, you know it's I think it's a great question um, and let me ask each of you where where do you see the greatest event in innovations in the healthcare sector coming from over the next year or the next 24 months where where can we get our early harvest um, as it were and Fried, let me start with you. Yeah, I think, you know, and I've seen some of the questions flowing, but uh, I would say I'll come back on, on the applications of, of digital because I, I, I think one of the, um, the problem we need to solve for in Africa is really a, a problem of, of capacity of when it comes to the clinical knowledge, the expertise and we may have specialists here and there. Um, and when you go into a hospitals, whether it's a cardiologist or radiologist, so you can bring technology, but you know, when you leverage digital to really augment your capabilities and particularly when it comes to very uh, specific specialities, I think that's a big step forward. And this is, I've seen some of the comments on, you know, digital AI could be a threat to jobs in Africa. I don't believe so. Truly, I don't believe so. It's, it's, they're gonna be more radiologists, more cardiologists, more neurologists in Africa. That's a given. And what we need to do is help build those specialists. Plus, of course, not only the specialists, but the radiographers, the nurses, and all the staff throughout the continuum of care. Uh, but we need to bring the tools that really enable these specialists, these nurses to really have the capacity to do their job properly. And, uh, you know, we, we started the journey with, you know, portable ultrasound at a time when we could put a, an ultrasound in the hand of a midwife that could really work um, you know, in Ghana, in chip compounds and, you know, in Kenya and in Ethiopia and very remote areas. I really, you know, tackle the issues of maternal and infant mortality. Uh, tomorrow, 
with AI, you know, helping us to triage more people on things like TB. I mean, TB kills more than COVID. Okay, let's let's face it. So that's the kind of things I I, I truly believe that intelligent. Um, well, still, let me take a step back. We still need to invest more in training, in education, in building the capacity and the capabilities in Africa. That's a given in healthcare. Right. But then, you know, equipping those healthcare workers with the right tools and particularly digital tools is going to be a, a different way of, uh, of delivering health every day to patients. Great. Thank you for that. Gregory, let me turn to you and ask you what kind of innovations are you working on? What kind of early early harvest can you expect to see over the next 12, 24 months that will be catalytic in terms of advancing uh, healthcare on the continent? Um, for me, the number one thing that comes uh, to mind is the area of molecular diagnostics. Um, COVID-19 showed us the lack of molecular diagnostic capacity and capability on the continent. And it's actually shocking that we had to wait for COVID-19 to tell us that. Whilst we have hepatitis, you know, HIV, that all require viral load testing. And today, unfortunately, for example, Ghana, most hepatitis patients are unable to have the most appropriate treatment simply because they are unable to do viral load testing. Right, which requires the same molecular diagnostic capacity and capability that is required for COVID-19 uh, uh, testing. So I think one of the things that I'm quite excited about is how are we using this newfound love for diagnostics, yeah. uh, particularly for COVID-19 yeah. testing, yes. to rebuild an entire right. molecular diagnostic infrastructure mm -hmm. of the continent that can enable us to be able to bring low-cost advanced molecular diagnostic skills that can complement everything from no, no, sexually transmitted no disease uh, molecular testing to infectious disease testing. And we're already doing this by repurposing existing laboratory, private laboratories um, in some of the countries that we are working in uh, for them to be able to accomplish this. But the next big step is actually manufacturing yeah. molecular diagnostic tests on the continent. Yeah. I mean, I think that would unleash um, the ingenuity in, in, in African scientists who live with these diseases every single day. Yeah, that's terrific. That's that's quite exciting. Uh, Jim, let me ask you, I mean, from, from where you're sitting and uh, all the different sectors you're looking at, where can we get a, a, an, an early win that will be impactful in terms of the health sector? I'm, I'm not a health expert, but two observations. Number one, uh, I'm, I think uh, we should all be very worried about food and nutrition um, in the next 12 to 24 months. I think I've heard a lot of concerns among leaders about the agricultural sector being able to ramp up and produce enough food to feed people and nutrition uh, and sanitation are critical issues. So working through private sector actors, for example, all the grantees that we work with, we're going to work with them to be spreading to all of their workers and to their customers. Um, and this goes through to down to farmers and you know informal sector uh, companies, uh, firms, micros, and so forth, the proper uh, uh, social distancing, sanitation, hand washing to stop the community spread. What Gregory said earlier is I think Africa is still, you know, early in the curve and um, really focusing on government and private sector and donors and multilaterals getting the word out to small villages far and wide and urban populations on proper health and sanitation is crucial. The other observation is I think that the pandemic has laid bare the fact that in many African countries, governments have sort of left the health sector to by default to donors to finance and support. And I don't think that's sustainable. Uh, donors can help, uh, you know, at, at the margin and, um, but to be the core financier of health systems and not really driving it from the government side, which can include, by the way, public-private partnerships, outsourcing to private sector, health services, clinics, rural, urban, and make it, design it in such a way that it's affordable and viable for uh, private sector to invest. And if there's a viability gap for it to be profitable, that's where donors can fill in. But we're not really building sustainable markets for healthcare 
And I think governments need to take on, you know, some of that financing and creative regulatory frameworks that allow private sector to be a, a more involved in providing the healthcare services immediately now in the simplest things, as well as going forward, that new model can be expanded and replicated. Great, great, thank you. Uh, Honorable Cabinet Secretary, Secretary let me uh, give you the last word. I, I know you're the trade minister, not the health minister, but you know, where, where are you, you know, where's your sense of urgency trying to get that, that, that early harvest, that, that wind that will be impactful in, in, the, in the health sector in, uh, in, in, in Kenya? Um, thanks. I think uh, I agree with Greg that uh, I think it's uh, uh, diagnostic capacity building in Africa is going to be one big thing because the reason we, we have low numbers is because we have low tests and uh, but we are also not having people dying in the streets uh, without any explanation. So I actually do think that we still have fairly uh, low incidents, but it would help to build up this confidence with a greater diagnostic capacity. And I think that's something we definitely are working on in Kenya. And I'm glad to have partnerships with M Pharma uh, for that. I think the second thing uh, is, uh, the, I think the revitalization of public health. Uh, our hospitals have all been um, uh, declaring and uh, reporting fairly low visitors, uh, visit levels. In the beginning, we thought it was because uh, of fear of COVID and the stigma associated with it. But latest analysis coming out is a lot of you know, hospital visits were really are coming out of uh, um, you know, failure to observe basic uh, public health uh, related issues and sanitation. So there'll be greater uh, focus on disease prevention uh, using uh, public health means. And I think that it's not innovative, but I think it's nice to have that uh, revival in, uh, uh, in as opposed to just focus on curative, uh, uh, curative uh, care. But thirdly, I think we also see in greater focus by governments on uh, on the health and health uh, and health services and especially uh, health workers. So we are seeing uh, that uh, resurgence. And finally, of course, uh, with this uh, greater requirement and, and, and shift towards greater um, security, then more health commodities will be produced uh, in, in Africa by default. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's terrific. Well, this is point at which I'd ask everybody to give the panel a big round of applause. But um, in lieu of that, let me just thank you all so much for just being so uh, interesting and, and taking this time. And uh, I, I think it's been a really rich conversation. So I'm hopeful we can continue it in some form or another. But uh, for now, we'll pause and let me just say thank you. And over to you, Flory. Yes, thank you so much, Whitney. What a, a great uh, discussion. Um, I was trying to take some notes and I decided that just too many interesting things being said by our esteemed panelists for me to keep up. So I thought I would just sit back and relax and, and, and enjoy um, the dialogue. We look forward uh, to following up with um, all of you on some of the things you've discussed and to learn how CCA can continue this important discussion on key issues that you've raised in terms of health and economic innovations and some of the policy issues that have been um, uh, touched on as well. So uh, thank you to all of you uh, for being a part of CCA's uh, Leaders Forum. And uh, let me now turn to Angela Wasuna uh, from Pfizer, who is also on CCA's board. Uh, to make some uh, closing remarks. Angela uh, is the Vice President for Global Policy and Corporate Affairs at Pfizer. And as I said, uh, she is, um, I'm delighted to have her as a member of uh, CCA's Board of Directors. Angela, over to you.
I hope you can all hear me. <laughs> so thank you, Flory. And a big thank you to His Excellency President Philippe Nussi and the terrific panel. I thought the discussions were impactful and solutions oriented. And it's also very good to hear from my fellow Kenyan and friend, Honorable Betty Maina. So thank you all for the work that you're each doing to contribute to the COVID-19 response efforts in Africa, supporting healthcare workers, patients, and families in need. This life altering and unprecedented crisis has in many ways brought out the best in companies and governments. And it really shines a light as we've just heard on the innovative minds leading the response efforts and offering solutions in Africa. So I'm very proud to be part of a company, Pfizer, that's leading and supporting the re response efforts on many fronts. So early in this crisis, our CEO announced five commitments to help bring forward therapies and vaccines quickly and to prepare our industry to better respond to future global health crises. Now these include sharing tools and insights in an open source platform in real time uh, with a broader scientific communities as well as other companies, so not just our own. Secondly, we've been marshalling our people and we have a dedicated SWOT team of leading virologists, biologists, chemists, and other vaccines experts who are focused solely on addressing this pandemic. Third, we're applying our drug development expertise to support the most promising candidates that companies bring forward. I mean, just this week, you may have all seen that we announced the start of four phase three studies on our various vaccines candidates. So this is moving at record speed and in a very scientific way. We're also offering our manufacturing capabilities to other companies. Again, this is novel in support of getting these life uh, saving breakthroughs into the hands of patients quickly, as quickly as possible. And I think we heard a bit of the discussion during the panel about concerns on how quickly the vaccine will get to um, our countries in Africa. And then finally, we're improving our future rapid responses by working with various agencies to build a cross industry rapid response team uh, that can action, that can act quickly when future epidemics surface. So at Pfizer, we also quickly uh, move to support the immediate global health effects of COVID-19 through our foundation. We committed $40 million uh, in cash grants to address urgent needs of partners who are now working to slow the spread of the virus within communities. In Africa, we've been supporting organizations such as AMREP, uh, uh, South Africa's Solidarity Response Fund, and the Red Cross Red Crescent, among others. Our country teams, and I know uh, many of you who are local know this, are already working with their respective governments to further, local, to, to further support local needs as they arise. So from my perspective as the head of emerging markets policy in an innovative biopharma company, I'm convinced that science will win this fight and that we'll come out of this unprecedented global experience stronger than ever. Today's discussion in my view is an incredibly important one. And my hope is that it's the first of many conversations that translate into long-term sustainable solutions for health systems in Africa and Pfizer is going to be a part of, of those solutions. So thank you, Flory. Thank you to the entire CCA team for hosting this important forum and for bringing to the table like-minded stakeholders who are working to deliver results, positively impact patients, and ultimately pave a road to a new normal in a post-COVID world. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. So hopefully everyone will join us uh, again tomorrow for CCA's Leaders Forum. We have um, an outstanding group of people that will be on a panel tomorrow. And we invite you all to come and be a part of it on Zoom or on, uh, to watch us on YouTube.